I will show a number of projects. It will a little bit be emphasized on work we've recently done on museums. Um, so I will show a, a number of museum projects. Uh, and I will give a small update on the long story of the project for Ansaldo, now in its 14th year for us. Um, but before I talk about museums, I would like to talk about architecture in a more general way, because designing museums normally, generally, is, is uh, one would say, um, a, a commission in a privileged environment. What do I mean by that? That um, to make architecture, uh, of course you need the architect, but the architect uh, operates, uh, cannot operate as an individual. Uh, none of us can go home and design a building. Uh, and then imagine that it will be built. Uh, we need a client, we need finance, we need um, the user, we need the city to give us permits, we need consultants and engineers to collaborate with us, we need contractors, and we even need project managers unfortunately, most of the time. Um, and that means that uh, we are dependent on circumstances. The circumstances to do a museum are normally very positive because you ha the client is normally quite articulate. There's normally a strong desire to do a good project. They are aware that the commissioning group or the board of trustees for a museum are normally familiar with architecture and they understand what it takes to make a building. So in a way, you have a special and nearly, uh, you know, the perfect ground for architecture to grow. So this is a privileged commission. I say this because this fertile ground doesn't exist so often. And we are not, as architects, always finding ourselves in a position of positive collaboration. In fact, there tends to be a, a sort of a confrontation. You know, we, we tend to be making things happen or involved in process nearly against the, our conditions. So before I talk about um, this, uh, these projects which I would say are conceived in quite positive conditions. I'd like to contextualize that work within the role of the architect in a more general way. This is a photograph of Shanghai, of Pudong. Um, this is what our world is increasingly looking like. This could be anywhere. It could even, it could be Doha, it could be Singapore, uh, it could even be, it could not quite, but the city of London is beginning to look more and more like this. Um, and it reminds us that um, our cities are now the consequence of development. This is what cities used to look like. Um, Development was channeled and organized uh, within 
predetermined forms or ideas of the benign city, the city made of streets and squares, and, and engaged within that benign city was an idea of public space. So therefore, there is a balance between architecture as object and architecture as something which contributes to making a city. Um, you know, none of these, this is Place de Vosges in Paris, so actually this architecture is, is beautiful architecture. Um, but it's not, you know, they're not, these are all individually performing buildings. You know, each one is trying to be better than the next. Um, and when we say better, it's quite difficult to, to work out what it's trying to be better at. Is it trying to be better at um, uh, financial reward? Or is it trying to be better, is it trying to be more noticeable than the next? Is it trying to be more efficient or is it trying to be taller? Or what is clear is that what happens when you go into the city, if you go to Pudong, uh, if you come out of one of these towers, you won't find anything at the street level. There is no real city. It's an illusion of a city. It's what, But this is what we take photographs of. This is what our cities look like. So this is a, th a discussion throughout architecture in my, ex in my, my feeling. Is we have increasingly become dependent on architecture as image over architecture as experience and that sort of, as I called it before, sort of this benign contribution that architecture can make to our daily lives that is architecture organized around us to be the backdrop within which life is conducted. As was mentioned, um, I, last year I was the director of the Architecture Biennale and I, I considered what I could contribute to the Biennale as a practicing architect and the theme that I developed, um, uh, Richard Sennett uh, gave me this title, uh, helped me with this title. The theme that I was interested in were the themes that I've just been talking about. In other words, the fact that the profession of architecture has become, in terms of its production, increasingly identified with making single buildings, uh, those buildings in a way like objects competing with each other. Part of that has been, uh, or the other side of that coin, has been the loss of um, the concept of making public space. So in other words, the space between buildings has become devalued. And another part of this uh, con conspiracy is that professionally, as, as, uh, as architects, we have become seduced into identifying our own uh, position in isolation to others, in competition to others, that the work of architects has to be sort of branded to be identified, that each architect has to have a sort of signature and has to be individually recognized. So from the production of singular buildings, the the competitive nature of the profession to be identified as individuals, the loss of public ground as uh, a unifying idea of the built environment, 
These things are all, I think, absolutely fundamental to our predicament and to, um, to confirm this even further, I think there is a, a lack of understanding between our professional intentions and potentials and society's expectations and often low opinion of us as a profession, that we are, I think, um, losing uh, our, um, you know, because of everything I've said, I think that it's become a sort of uh, cynicism and skepticism about what the profession of architecture contributes to society. This seems to me a sort of tragedy because I think most architects believe when they go to work in the morning, they're not only doing business, making money uh, or losing money, um, but they are, they believe that they are contributing something through their work to society. So if they believe that, why does society generally not believe them? Why, why is there a sort of uh, cynicism about architects? There's a sense that they're all uh, egoists and um, uh, self-centered and only interested in imposing their own uh, ideas. And yet, the profession believes that it can contribute towards society. So this is a mismatch. So that's what Common Ground was about, was identifying those different issues and saying, shouldn't we consider what we share professionally, the predicaments that we share, all of these things that, that I talk about? And, uh, that, and I will talk about that in my lecture. So, um, if we start off, or if I start off negatively, saying um, architecture has become isolated, the concerns of architects have become, um, are often not trusted, that the desire for um, architecture, architectural image over architectural experience uh, has been promoted by the media and by the fact that we have become so used to images. Um, invariably, I have conversations with people and they will say, oh, I love that building or I love you know, that building. And I say, but have you been there? No, no, I haven't been there, but I love the building. Um, which is a strange reality, because we all know buildings now, but we don't necessarily know them by being there. We know them because we've seen images so often. So now we judge buildings, not by being there, but what, by what they look like, by images. And this is a strange evaluation, um, not dissimilar to saying, well, I really love apples, you know. Have you, have you eaten an apple? No, I've never eaten an apple, but um, it, it looks, I mean, it looks really good. Um, how can you like an apple if you haven't eaten it? Uh, and yet we're now deciding whether we like architecture without going there. And for me, this is probably the most confusing idea. Because architecture struggles from being um, not very agile. Um, it's not, as I said before, we're not like artists. We can't go home and paint a painting. We need 
a lot of people to do it with us, and it probably takes three or four years to do it. So it suffers from being very cumbersome, it's very slow. Uh, it, it can't make comments in the way that poetry can, or be as engaging as theater, or as, uh, it can't be like poetry. I mean, it's got all sorts of, however, if it does get built, um, it has the most extraordinary potential above all others, more than painting, more than sculpture. Because um, as a physical thing, we are making spaces which you, you are in. We're not just making pictures to look at. Architecture, in its experiential potential, is probably has more power than than anything else. Materially, uh, you know how it's made, what the materials are, how light comes in, how it creates space. These things are profoundly powerful, and yet architecture so rarely engages that. But when it does. Um, this is architecture, this is when architecture works. And yet, we've decided to, exp to judge architecture and to look at architecture through images. And the images become, and our judgment of architecture has become more to do with what architecture looks like than how it feels. So that's a, an enormous concern, in my opinion. So I want to talk about architecture from that point of view. I want to, say, I want to show our work from this first concern, the concern or the, the idea that we can, with material and space and light, you know, quite simple, mundane elements, the real stuff of architecture, that you can make something with an intensity and with an integrity that may, um, may not create the most stunning images, but maybe uh, leaves or creates uh, something physical. So that's, that's one emphasis of architecture that I'm, I'm interested in, the idea that, that how you build something, um, whatever materials that might be in, that the way you manage and organize and compose and construct and consider this uh, mundane, in a way, process of, of uh, building forms, making spaces, making surfaces, uh, allowing light into a building, allowing views from a building. Uh, this is the management of architecture somehow, and that there is an enormous uh, pleasure within the management of the, those decisions, whatever the materials are, whether that's in uh, this is Alaska, whether it's in glass or it's in brick or in anything else. The second um, component of architecture that I believe is important um, in this idea of common ground, because the theme that I've just talked about, the idea of materiality of space, um, is not, is not a, an intellectual idea, it's a physical idea which I think connects uh, the individual with the world. I mean, I think that architecture in its physical state um, uh, gives a certain meaning and a certain comfort. So uh, it, it's, it's more than decoration or more than composition. It's the idea of 
creating um, a place. So the second theme is uh, about, um, I suppose, how architecture can um, offer some idea of collective uh, space or um, can participate uh, socially, that the building not, not only is an object, but that it can um, offer something to the city and it can offer something to the way that we live our lives. But again, beyond the image of the building, but I suppose in the way that the building, um, yes, off offers this, uh, um, this desire that we have to congregate, to be social. Um, however individualistic our society has become, however much time people spend um, on their computers or online or looking at their phones, there's still a primary desire amongst everybody to congregate. You know, why is everybody here tonight? Why do people sit in cafes and read books? Why do people go to the cinema? Why don't they just look at the DVD at home? We are instinctively and resolutely and stubbornly drawn towards ideas of, of, um, of um, collection. We, we liked to go to things together. Why do we go to bars and restaurants? Why, why does everyone pay a fortune to go and sit in a restaurant uh, with other people that they don't know, who they won't talk to, uh, and eat food which will be uh, five times, ten times more than it would be if they cooked it at home? It's a strange thing that we like to, to congregate. And architecture and uh, the making of cities has always responded to that. It's always, in a way, catered to this primary desire, animal desire we have to become collective. And that, um, that great uh, quality that architecture has always had, to, to elaborate that, to become, to provide the backdrop of this collective theater. And one would have to say that that backdrop and that offer within our modern city has become more and more mean and it's become more and more uh, closed. So that's an aspect of buildings which I think we really have to work very hard at to see whether even the most private building can contribute to this socialization, this tendency to socialize, can architecture um, enjoy, encourage this, this tendency? So I'm, just a very few examples of our work. This is probably um, the building that is most um, uh, image uh, uh, sense, I mean, it, it, in a way, it's a very image uh, imageful uh, building, uh, unusually for us, but it was the building for the Ameris America's Cup in Valencia, and it was for the v it, the 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 purpose was as a VIP building for the America's Cup. Um, the people that came to watch the America's Cup, and they would have the, the privileged people that would were allowed to be there, but the city also wanted it to become the symbol of uh, the sit of the America's Cup and the symbol of the new regeneration and the re reconnection of the city to the sea. Valencia, like many cities by the, by the sea, uh, depended on its commercial life and its whole history is based on the sea, but actually 
doesn't have a very, the city itself doesn't have a very strong connection to the water. So there's an idea of making that, there was an idea of making that connection. And I complained, well, I, I pointed out that during the, that during the competition, I pointed out that this um, desire to make a symbol for the city, a public symbol, didn't really work with the program of a VIP building. Um, because it wasn't going to be a very popular building if most people couldn't go into it. So what we did was to create a building which has these different layers. And it meant that people can walk through the building. So the building became uh, uh, a public building. I mean, we literally uh, undid, you know, the, the whole ground floor and the lower ground floor, while the upper, upper floors remained uh, a VIP building. The lower floors became absolutely public, and therefore everybody from the city felt that they'd been in the building. Even if they couldn't go to the whole building, the building somehow, um, by, by changing its um, program, we forced the client to reconsider the, the whole concept, that it became from a private building to, to an apparently public building. Uh, this is another building. This was uh, for the BBC in Scotland. Um, this is an office building built for uh, the BBC and the, the, an the anticipated program, well, the, pr the purpose of this building was to make radio programs. There were two distinct activities. One is a series of activities which happens in offices. The preparation of programs, all of the contractual and administrative activities that go along with that. And the second is the making of radio programs, <coughs> excuse me, which re requires um, technical space. It was anticipated that these two activities would be separated, that there would be two different buildings. There would be an office building and there would be a technical building with the studios. And my idea was to put these two things together. So these are the studios. Under each of these floors is a, a radio studio and of different sizes because they needed small ones. You know, the most small, the smallest is here, and then the biggest is up here. Um, and we push the two things together. That means that if you're working on a on a program, on a radio program, and you're an accountant or a bookings manager or something, not daily involved in recording, you are continuously aware of the thing that you are working on. So these two activities are put together. But it was a very uncomfortable pushing together because we end up with um, this series of boxes inside. And I encourage the client that this sort of um, hillside of terraces would become useful because these could be spaces where people met. These could be meeting places, social places, um, common places, if you like. And that each floor has one of these common spaces. And you work in your desk here, but if you want to go meet someone, not in a meeting room, you have different meeting rooms here, but just to create another. And the whole idea was to give a sense of, you know, collective space. So it doesn't belong to anybody, but it belongs to everybody. And in fact, and, and the client was very, very nervous about this. They didn't want to pay for this extra space. 
Um, they didn't think it would be used, but in fact, and we had to reduce the office area in order to, to pay for this. But in fact, in, in reality, it's continuously used. Um, everybody also walks to their desk, so if you live, you know, if you're on any of these floors, everybody goes by the stair, which also means that everybody is visible, everybody is, sees each other on their way to work, or, so you always know. <laughs> so this, this element is an unrequired, it was not in the brief, it was not asked, asked of us, and in fact, they didn't even really want it. Um, because it is the collective space, it's the sort of useless space that no one really uh, can define. But in the end, it's the space which has become the defining um, element of the whole building. It's, it's used now for, they do cinema projections, they do lectures, they do parties. Uh, it's in continuous use. Uh, the, the, the bar is up here and the restaurant's up here. So at six o'clock, everybody goes and has a drink on the, at the top. So it was an attempt, even within you know, a corporation within an institution to look for the sort of, we're taking off. Um, <laughs> look for uh, social space. Um, this desire to interpret um, commercial or institutional projects because as I said before it's, it's easier to talk about public space in public projects, in museums or railway stations much more difficult in office buildings or, or commercial projects this is a, a project we did in China a uh, residential development and in a beautiful valley, the Bamboo Valley. And the client wanted us to build uh, one or two apartment buildings in this beautiful valley. It would have meant that the, the Bamboo Valley was destroyed in uh, the construction of the buildings. And also, even if we put landscaping back, the whole identity of the place would have been lost. So instead, the idea was to divide into sm small volumes. So instead of two volumes, make 11. And that these buildings would then be scattered and create a sort of community. And the forest would be planted again so that the buildings sat within this bamboo forest and by doing this there was a, uh, not only was there a, a continuity in terms of the environmental idea of the, this un incredible setting but there was also an idea of trying to turn um, a residential uh, project into something more c collective. Okay, so the next topic, so uh, these are topics about the potential of architecture. So the first is its, its physical um, power in, in the simple stuff of architecture, in, in its, its material, in, in light, and in space. The second is the sort of societal, the, the idea of the building as architecture as part of, a, of um, a collective gesture. And the third is um, architecture's place within an idea of history and an idea of uh, built, the built environment and the continuity of the built environment. Um, again, I would say that the modern movement um, was very uh, was obsessed 
with um, with change and wanted to detach modern architecture from history. There was a real desire at the beginning of the 20th century to make a break with history. And modern architecture, therefore, should reflect new times. It should reflect modern, modern society with modern architecture. And we should uh, create a, a modern architecture for, for a, 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 new, a new world. Um, this dream was a very beautiful dream, and you know there was wonderful um, examples of uh, of this uh, you know, this dream. But by the time, by by the end of the twentieth century, or m much before that, by the sixties and seventies, this detachment, this um, desire for modern architecture to become autonomous. Um, not only physically, but also contextually and historically, I think, had uh, become exhausted. So I think that we re-examined, I think there's been a re-examination about context, both his historical and physical context. And I believe that that's another incredibly important aspects for architecture and where architecture should um, look for part of its idea. This was a project, again, a big, is a big commercial project um, in the center of Innsbruck in a very historical and most important uh, street in Innsbruck where we tried to demonstrate that even a modern building and a new program uh, you know, a big shopping center could sit within a historical architecture that without resorting to a pastiche, without uh, making a parody of historical architecture, could try to be integrated within its context. So we were concerned to look at uh, the, the, the context our facade is 80 meters long or something, so it's it's much wider than any of the other buildings in the street. So we are, we were concerned to to break the single building down into by moving the geometry. We were concerned. We realized that the the shadow on the other f buildings, the sort of modulation and the richness of the facades, was part of and the verticality of these buildings was important. Therefore, it informed the architecture. Um, actually, I mean, th this, this image shows it standing a little bit separate, but it became completely accepted within a very conservative city as, as a building which is both um, different but also um, fits in. So in terms of architectural form, about what buildings, you know, how buildings should look, where they get their ideas from, I mean, this is clearly an enormously difficult thing for architecture. I mean, it's the thing that we struggle with most. What should buildings look like? You know, why should they look like anything? How do we get our formal ideas? Then I'm, I think it's very important that we we think about history, and we think about forms, and we think about typologies, and we think about context. Um, this is a studio for Anthony Gormley, the sculptor. It's in an industrial area, and uh, we wanted the building to feel part of this area, to continue a slightly industrial quality. And he wanted a very big uh, yard to work in, which was also very similar to uh, how an industrial building works. And in order to emphasize this idea of this space becoming uh, 
part of the workshop or part of his uh, activities because he works with big pieces of sculpture. Therefore, this shouldn't just be like a car park or um, an empty piece of ground in front of the building. So I force them to put the stairs on the outside. So by putting the stairs from the outside, which is a bit inconvenient because if you want to go from here into there and it's raining, you have to run or, or there. But what's interesting is that it makes this space into a sort of public space because all of a sudden these stairs uh, are a sort of connector between the building and the space. And the form of the building becomes a sort of connector with uh, the context. Um, so I'm talking now a little bit about history and about um, uh, context and architectural form. And this is an extreme project we're doing in Sudan um, in a site. Uh, it's an Egyptian excavation being done by the German archaeological team. They've been working for 20 years or so on this site. It's the most isolated place I've ever been. It's quite extraordinary. And it's a building to protect the, um, the, 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 the city, the excavated city, Egyptian city is here. And they are finding a lot of objects and they need a place to store those objects. So this building is to store those objects a bit like a museum. There's the, there's the location here. This is the excavated uh, city. The, one of the main temples is here. And the idea is that when visitors come, they can see all the, the excavated objects. But also, from this platform here, you can look out over the dig. That's why the building uh, elevates, so you, by the time you're standing here, you're one and a half meters above the ground. It was a very difficult um, uh, discussion as to what should a piece of architecture look like in such a primitive place. How should it, what type of building should we make in this place? And here you can see this concept of of um, rising up, so by the time you're here, you're looking over the, the archaeological dig. Um, so we were really interested in the idea of the building being made in a very primitive manner, in fact, going back to a nearly um, archaic architecture. Again, this is something that we're interested to do, is to think about how we can reduce architecture to a very basic series of elements. In this case, it was absolutely necessary because um, we can't have windows. If the windows just become destroyed by the sand, um, and therefore, it's while it has to shade and protect, um, it has to do it with the most primitive of, of elements, of mediums, of, of the architecture, of, of, the, of the elements itself. So there was a, 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 there's a very interesting idea of just reducing the building back to its, to really primary elements of walls and columns. And it's all made from concrete, which is made from the stones around. Um, so talking about history, I'm going to show very quickly a few projects which deal with history. This is Milan, you can recognize the Castello, and we made a proposal to complete the Rivellino here, and this is at the moment uh, a very beautiful ruin. It was as you probably know, part of a, the fortification which 
continued as the walls, and uh, it was left as a fragment during the reconstructions at the end of the 19th century. Um, it sits there, um, becoming more and more picturesque um, and harmless in a way, but there was an idea that this could become uh, a new entrance and also could become an extension of the museum. So we made a study about how you could take this volume to work with history, to work with this piece. A lot of these were remodeled, they're 19th century additions and modifications in this um, um, attempt to romanticize the castle, which happened. And so we started to think about how you might turn the ruin uh, into a complete volume, not by um, imitating its historical condition or completing in a historical way, but by uh, analyzing the fragments which are there and making a new building from the old building. So this was the proposal to find, uh, you know, build out of the ruin, to, to maintain a certain respect for the ruin, but to create a new building volume. Talking of history, this is the center of Berlin, this is the Museum Island. Uh, the new Schloss will be here. This is Unter den Linden. Um, this goes up to Alexanderplatz. So Unter den Linden used to finish on the castle. Opposite the castle was uh, Schinkel's Alters Museum. The dome is here, replacing Schinkel's uh, church. Um, here is the university. And um, the, the barracks used to be here. This, so this was absolutely the center of the Prussian Empire with the king, with God, with the university, and the army. Uh, and then with culture in Schinkel's Alters Museum. This is the Alters Museum. After the Alters Museum, the Neues Museum was built by Stuller, his, his student, and Stiller did the master plan also for the National Gallery, so these came along. Later came the Boulder and then the Pergamon. So these constitute the five buildings of the Museum Island. They were all bombed in the war. Uh, all of them repaired, not so well, but they were repaired, and except for, for Neues Museum. So I'm just going to show the work we did to this ruin, the building we are making here, and the building that we did here. I'm going to speed up. So this is now that condition of the, this is the Noise Museum with the completed Noise Museum. Here's the, 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 the National Gallery, the colonnade which goes around the island and the back of uh, Altus Museum. This is the building after the war. Um, you can see that the other buildings have been Repaired, National Gallery's been put back, Pergam's been put back, Noise Museum stays as a ruin, the southwest, uh, northwest corner completely destroyed, the staircase hall completely bombed, the Greek courtyard completely destroyed, this wing, that whole corner missing. Um, the, the damage is uh, everywhere, some places total, other places not so bad. This side of the building actually generally wasn't so bad as the other side. On the other hand, you can see uh, decoration still remaining, so very inconsistent damage. This is the ruin as we inherited it. Again, you can see places where you know, architecture stays. There are even 
uh, frescoes and you can see decorations, wall decorations. But on the other hand, the whole roof, the floor is missing, the roof is missing, this floor is missing. So very um, inconsistent damage. This was the staircase hall. You can see the, uh, this is the fragment of the stair. It's ruined all the way down to the basement. This is the ground floor. So the bombs destroyed all the way to the basement. This is how the stair was. It's a beautiful uh, stair of Stulla, completely destroyed. And this is our reconstruction. And you can see that the concept was to repair, repair the, sorry, to repair the walls to complete, and in a way to reconstruct the historical in its form. So it's an absolute, it's a direct copy of the, the form of the stairs, but without copying decoration. And this was the theme for the whole project, to maintain the, the ruin in a way, or at least to, to protect the, the ruined elements. Uh, to repair and to complete. But it wasn't to imitate. We, we rarely imitated except certain occasions. So we can see here that there's a typical condition where we have uh, some places with decoration, some places completely missing, other places very exposed. And we had to do this process. We photographed every surface we made computer images of everything, and then we would draw what we wanted to happen. This is just showing a sequence of restoration. So this was the original. This is what we inherited. This is us starting to repair and starting to build back. You can start to see some construction happening, uh, new construction, imitating the constructive process, but not the decorative process. Now you can see it coming even more, the floor being repaired and gradually working its way step by step, not as an imitation of the past. So you can see that we've retained and cleaned the, the original, we've made new but copying the constructive techniques uh, and the whole, the idea is that the room uh, feels like a a complete room, that its totality is a sort of completeness, but without destroying this, uh, you know, so that's what we begin with, and that's what we finish with. And one of the things, going back to my first point, what was interesting about this was that the, um, the uh, this was a very long process, there was 10 years of discussion in Berlin during this process, and there was a lot of anxiety that the project would be about destruction. And uh, we argued that it wasn't, it was about what was saved. And the, the response to the building was, uh, was really overwhelming. But the reason that people, uh, I believe, like the building, was because it's so physical, because you feel so strongly the materiality of the building. And when we went to the ruin at the beginning, the ruin has this incredible presence. Ruins tend to be, in a way, more architectural than built buildings, because they, they somehow they expose their, their bones. Um, and that was something we didn't want to lose. It was something so powerful in the original building that that was something that we wanted to maintain. And actually, I think the popularity of the building is completely based on the presence of the material uh, of the original and the way that the new has been so explicitly um, collaborated with the original. Now I'm just going to, I realize I'm running very late, so I'm going to show a, a number of museums. Um, 
coming from this. The first one is the extension to the noise museum. So here is the noise museum. We, we were commissioned, the competition asked us to put a lot of functions into the noise museum um, that the museum island needed and we refused to put them in there, so therefore we had to find another place. So they, there was an anticipation that this would become like an entrance building. But now what, we've, what we're doing is we're building this building here. You can see this is the colonnade I showed you before. And our new building links the Pergamon and the Noyes Museum and the colonnade all together. It, we took the inspiration from this in, image of Schinkel this is uh, Alter's Museum looking out onto the Lustgarten, onto the Schloss. This is an extraordinary idea of, you know, really one of the first museums. We are inside the building. These people are inside the building, but they've never gone through a door. They've come through the colonnade, the portico. They've gone up this staircase, and they're already inside a public building. So this was an idea of Schinkel, which was really an extraordinary invention, because it's really one of the first public buildings. It's not a royal, it's not a palace, it's a building for the people. So when we were tasked with building a new building here, here's the portico of Schinkel, um, we were interested in drawing on all of the elements which are here, the porticos, the staircases, and the colonnade. So we extend this colonnade, and we extend it around. We create, we extend the base of the Pergamon along the river, and we create new steps rather similar to the steps of Shinko or of the National Gallery, and we create this huge portico. So the building has a historical reference. It seems to somehow have come away, come out of the the existing conditions. Here's the base of the Pergamon. Um, and yet, it sits um, somewhere between uh, a modern building and a historical building. It's actually extremely uh, minimal and, uh, in a way, quite austere. And yet, it, its concept is grounded in an understanding of the context uh, um, both physical and historical. Opposite that building is a small um, museum that we built for a private collector. So the buildings I'm now showing, I, I think in a way I don't have to talk too much about them because we're getting late, but um, they're, they're now all museums and I think they rehearse the um, ideas that I've already talked about. So the idea of making space, of the strong physical um, materiality of architecture, um, the importance of light, and the importance of context. So I, there's like eight museums which I'm going to go through, this being the first one. So importance of context, this was a bombed corner, the building completes, completes it. The, the materiality, this is brick with a sort of render, and it tries to be both a modern building uh, with extraordinary exhibition spaces, very beautiful rooms, really enjoying the context and the, enjoying its materiality. Uh, a museum in the north of England, this is Wakefield, and an industrial <clears throat> area. The building is here, a very difficult industrial context. It's approached. The main, the center of the city is here. The view that we had was over here. This is a sort of motorway. So from here, this motorway, you look down on this site. There's a pedestrian bridge here and there's a new development here. So the building is viewed from every side. And museums have only one entrance. 
normally. They don't want too many entrances and they don't want too many windows. So this was a sketch I did at the beginning, thinking about how, how to make a building which is looking in all the way, different ways. It has four facades. How to make it have a, um, a complexity, but without it being um, a sort of arbitrary idea of form. So the concept was that each one of these forms, that the building is made of these different forms, and each form is a room, and that these rooms would become the exhibition rooms. So in fact, that's how the plan is working on the, on the first floor. It's rather like a 19th century building. You come up, and then you go through the galleries, back home, and then you go down again. So it's actually a very classic plan, except the geometry has become contorted. And the architectural game was to develop the external form in such a way that the, the, the volumes had an interesting composition, but at the same time, every external form represents an internal form. This is the finished building, so the, sorry, the shapes of each one of these spaces reflects the internal room, and each room then has a skylight at its higher level, and you can see how the space moves from this slightly dynamic uh, composition works. Um, we built two museums in, in England in the last years. This was a, uh, so the first one was Wakefield. This is a smaller museum um, on, the, on the Kent coast. This is where Turner used to come and work. He believed that the skies and the water is facing north onto the sea. These were the most beautiful skies in Europe. And he spent a lot of time here. The museum is an attempt to regenerate this area, which is now uh, really struggling economically. And the building tries to create some relationship between the sea and the, and the city. It creates a series of rooms which benefit from north light and um, make a yeah, series of exhibition spaces which are, have the atmosphere of being st like a studio spaces. Another museum we've recently finished, which is the extension of the St. Louis Art Museum. This is the original building. It's the remaining building from the uh, 1904 World's Exhibition in St. Louis, and uh, it became the um, City Art Museum. And we extended the building to the left. This shows you the site. So here's the Casco. We were looking from here. And our extension is new exhibition space. So the galleries work like this. It's, a, it's another 19th century building where it's a sort of donut. And then we've created a new donut or half a donut. So here with new space for contemporary collection, modern, modern, modern art. The idea which you can see expressed in this image is of uh, uh, daylight going through the roof. So it's a, the whole building is held together by a, a concept of top light. Here you can see the plans of the original building, the new extension with an entrance here, a series of galleries which connect to the existing building here and here. This is the new building. Because we're in a park, it was also important that I wanted people to be aware. So when they come into the building, first of all, there's a window to the north, window to the 
east to the south and to the west. So these, so although museums tend not to want large museums, uh, large windows, we integrated these in a way that uh, works with the art. There shows, shows the idea of the concrete roof, and this shows the idea of how the daylight goes through the concrete roof and diffuses um, into the museum. Um, it's very difficult to integrate daylight into museums because um, daylight is damaging for paintings. It's extremely difficult for drawings and etchings. And, but for, for um, paintings, it's acceptable, but we have to control the amount of light. We have to get rid of UV. And of course, the amount of daylight which comes is totally variable. So we have to work out how to, to bring the correct amount of daylight, which is, and you, don't, you want to do that in the most simple way. So all of these projects with top light are working without complex um, systems. They're just filtering the light and diffusing the light. Um, closer to home, so this is Ansaldo. This was the competition uh, project that we showed 14 years ago. And it shows the concept of the a new building of an industrial character sitting within the industrial quarter. So it's a building quite secret inside the city block. Here you can see the idea. So we given that this is all industrial, we felt that these were not facades. Actually, the interesting thing was, in a way, to create the internal, you know, this was the facade. That you go into the building, and then, like in a Milan courtyard, you would find the facade. So, a series of volumes uh, with this central uh, lantern, Entrance. I'm going to flick through these quite quickly. Here you see the upper level of, again, a sort of enfilade of galleries, uh, a series of big rooms, big changing exhibition, auditorium, <coughs> and then three major rooms, and then a series of secondary rooms. So you can, you can do a sequence around, or you could go directly into a group of galleries and you arrive up into this lantern. Um, this is the building sort of being completed. I think this was a few months, this was six months ago. It's gradually, it's nearly finished now. Um, that shows the lantern, how you come in from the ground floor and you move up into this lantern and then the galleries. The space is being finished. The idea of the lantern. Very last project, um, a building we opened two weeks ago in Mexico City. Um, uh, there's a, a whole new development here. This is Polanco. Um, Carlos Slim just built a new museum here. Uh, Fernando Romero was the architect. And there's a new shopping center, an office center here. And we have this very difficult triangular site here with a, a busy road on this side uh, and a train, uh, a train that goes twice a day on this side. It's for a private collection, a very um, important private collection. There's the triangular site, there's the train. This used to be the breweries, all the so a lot of industry was here, so this train goes past and services the, um, this district. The Carlos Slim Museum is here. This is the completed building. The, the climate in Mexico is completely comfortable. It's about, it always sits within 20 degrees. 
and it never gets too hot, never gets too cold. So an early idea of the project, sorry, an early idea of the project was to create a base, some sort of public base, and then a sort of public uh, square. Uh, because you can be inside and outside very comfortably. And then to make two galleries above. So we were trying to make sort of public activities here and gallery spaces here. And this was an early image where I was interested in opening up the whole of the ground floor as a public room. Uh, I was interested, this is um, Diego Rivera's house in Mexico City. We were interested in this uh, roofscape. This is Osenfant by Corbusier's house for, for Osen, Charles Osenfant. And this was the developing <coughs> project showing a, a public level, completely open. So this is the lobby, but the lobby is sort of half inside, half outside. Then a sort of event space and public space here, a vitrine, which allows you to see in and out, and then two exhibition floors. We developed that in a larger scale and examined the daylight quality of the top floor, and we moved from this uh, three, eight lanterns to four. Right. This is the, more like the final scheme. You can see, so this is the open ground floor. This is coming up, this is the event spaces here and the two exhibition floors. This is the exhibition floor being finished, the top floor being finished. More updated model. The concept of the lower floors. So going back to the, the story I was telling before about the idea of trying to make a building have a sort of social performance, so the idea that in the center of Mexico, this platform should be a square, that this lobby should be a public, and this floor should be public. This is, in fact, how it's working. So the upper level is really working as a, a meeting place. I'm not going to talk about the plans for a second. So This shows you the openness of the ground floor. So the ground floor lobby is created by these three big screens which open. So most of the time, the whole ground floor is open. This is the cafeteria, it's outside. This is the lobby, and then you go in. I'm going to throw these quickly. The final model, this is the building sort of being completed. You can see the square and the, the two lower levels. The square being finished. The upper level here, this um, meeting hall, vitrine, sculpture hall, and then these are the two gallery floors. The building being finished. The lobby level, so you can see this is the entrance door. This is coming in. These doors stay open the whole day because the climate is so comfortable. So there's no real threshold. You don't quite know when you've entered the museum. This is the, uh, the first floor level. And the idea of a room which, so it's the space here. It's a glass box which has no real uh, function. It was a provocative space that I wanted to, uh, to force the building to have a social life. Because these two floors are gallery floors. This is where you go and look at art. And these floors are meant to be where people do things, so lectures and events. And I was very comfortable that I knew these would work, but I was never quite sure whether this would work, and it was very reassuring to see uh, lectures happening. This is a conference with Gabriel Orozco, um, uh, me and um, Hans Ulrich Obrist here doing a conference, and you can see how you know, this room, which actually has a curtain, you can close it off. You know, it's, it's a sort of a social space, which actually brings the museum, stops it being a museum, it becomes much more of a, 
uh, social center and also allows other types of performances uh, to happen. And then going up through the space, this is the finished museum. These are the gallery spaces, the top floor, and the very top floor. You can see the daylight, um, absolutely beautiful daylight through the lanterns. And at night, you can start, so you can see the you can see the plaza, so this is the first public space in a way. This is the entrance to the museum. So the, mu the museum begins here. Here's, so you go under the skirt and you're, then the doors are here. So you never really know when you enter the museum. Here is the, the public room where events happen and here are the two gallery floors. That's the last slide. Thank you very much.